Why, why was it so important to you, to Tom, to Stephen, to memorialize these stories? Um, you know, listen, the best stories are from history, no matter what. The, uh, always, for us, nonfiction is always more fascinating than fiction. I know, it's just the way it is. And there's uh, no greater stories of human cost, triumph, uh, passion, love, and uh, and just uh, you know, the the biggest story of our world is keeping it in a democratic, beautiful place. And so mm. those stories, they're simple. But now this one, um, I didn't realize until I watched it how important and crucial what these guys did. Because, you know, we all remember uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, Saving Private Ryan, but that D-Day invasion, it, it couldn't have happened without, without these guys. Yeah. what they did. Yeah. Talk about that for a sec. Well, I mean, they were the tenderizer, right, on this uh, tough steak. How's that? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and it was our guys, the guys we talk about here, who uh, ran those missions. They didn't exactly know how they were going to go, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but it was important to soften up uh, the mainland of Europe there so our boys could land without any more jeopardy than they already experienced. And that's where the title came from. So now for the stars who played some of the brave soldiers and masters of the air. Let's start with Callum Turner, who plays Major John Bucky Egan, the best guys. pal of Austin Butler's character, Major Gail Buck Clevin. Now, Callum still got lats like a bat from all the rowing George Clooney made him do in The Boys in the Boat. Hey, now. It's looking good. So Anthony Boyle plays Lieutenant Harry Crosby, who braved air sickness to become the 100th's first navigator and who guided the pilots through treacherous bombing runs to bullseye strikes that took out everything from German weapons factories, railroad supplies lines, and put the war on Hitler's doorstep. Um, now, Anthony's versatile, too. Now, he's just uh, played, he's, it's coming out now, plays Lincoln assassin John Wilkes Booth in the Apple TV Plus series Manheim. Thank you. You're killing it. You know that, right? Netflix, now, baby. And we have Nate Mann, who plays Major Rosie Rosenthal. Yeah. This heroic pilot who reached the 25 missions needed to go home, but he kept going, reached 52, getting shot down twice. And Barry Keoghan okay. plays the heroic flyer, Lieutenant <laughs> Curtis Biddick. Now, he was Oscar nominated for The Banshees of Inishirin, and we saw a lot more of his range, and even more than that, if you look closely, in Saltburn. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Rafferty Law plays Sergeant Ken Lemons, a crafty mechanic who patched up these bullet riddle planes and kept them airborne. And last but hardly least comes Josiah Cross, who plays Lieutenant Richard Macon, one of the heroic Tuskegee Airmen who were unsung at the time, but when given the chance, bombed the hell out of the Nazis. Welcome, gentlemen. So, Gary, uh, Damian Lewis, Ron Livingston, Donnie Wahlberg, Tom Hardy, Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, Colin Hanks, are among the many who popped in Band of Brothers, went on to have great career. In the Pacific, we, have James, we had James Badge Dale, John Bernthal, Rami Malek, and many others who popped in the Pacific. Um, how many speaking roles in Masters of the Air? Now, uh, 325 speaking roles. So, uh, and so now, Austin Butler has Elvis, and Dune 2 now. Where was he then when you guys shot this? Because what I love about this is we're looking at this, uh, this, this, this group of handsome young men, and some of you are going to be big stars. Some of you kind of already are. Well, um, I got to tell you, these guys, all the great guys that went before them are great guys and fabulous. But, <laughs> but I love these guys a lot. And, uh, and really a real array of great actors in this show. And I... They've already got great careers going on, and uh, things we'll see pretty, pretty quickly, I think. Um, but what was the question? 
I, I was asking, I was sort of getting your reaction to these um, epic series as a propulsive force in launching big careers. And um, well, we're really proud of that, yeah. you know, and, and we want to believe that that's the case, that we that uh, we're really good at identifying young actors and actresses who really are going to bring it, you know, through their lives. Yeah. And um, we've just been lucky, I'll tell you. But uh, we, we love them all. Now, and, and, um, and you told me that, uh, and you'll have to pronounce his name, Shooty. Shooty, yeah, Shooty and, Gatwa. Yes. Uh, and, the new Doctor Who, right, worked as one of the Tuskegee Airmen. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, Isabel May, um, she plays, uh, you know, she's, she's not in there that long. But Isabel she, May is she's the, the fairy uh, dust on this she show. Is the, she's yeah. the, the face that prompted uh, Taylor Sheridan to write 1883. That's so I'm sure we're going to see a lot of great things from her. Yeah, um, wave Izzy, will you? Yeah, wow. We love you so Izzy. much. She really... You wouldn't believe any other woman in the world could make Austin dream of them through the entire war. <laughs> it's hard to find. Anyway. So I want all of you guys, tell me a quality about your specific character that most connected you to your character. Let's, let's, let's start with Rafferty. I mean, for me, there were so many qualities that I, I was inspired by when I kind of came to know Ken Lemons through his book and through the research I did. Uh, I think the thing that stuck out for me most was just his willingness to lead by example. Um, he was always spoken of as such like a warm, humble, loving person. Um, and I think throughout the show, it's it was really important to be able to kind of bring that to the ground crew and show from their eyes and their ears what they were going through as these guys went off on these missions and sometimes didn't return or a lot of the time didn't return. So I think it was like his willingness to kind of push through and lead by example to his men. And Barry, how about you? Boy, your, your character arc is just so shocking and gutting. I mean, it was incredible. I died ages ago, like episode three. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but they're in spirit. And um, what connects me? I mean, he's, uh, he's Irish, half Irish, I mean, given that. But, you know, I wanted to kind of bring um, a sense of, you know, the Irish kind of bring a, a sense of humor to, to, to massive things, you know what I mean, and, and try kind of, you know, play and brush it under the carpet. So I wanted to kind of humanize and, and, and do that in, in a way. Um, but yeah. And, and Josiah, how about you? I mean, you know, the, we've, since things have been made about the Tuskegee Airmen, but it was a very interesting, um, their, their rise of importance um, in World War II was quite a thing to behold. Um, what did you latch on to about your character? Um, for me, I think that historically, over time, um, specifically, I guess, I mean, with all of us sitting here, you know, outside of Gary, of course, but, you know, we come from a different generation. Um, and I think that there's like a... <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Whoa! I really wasn't joking. My bad. My bad. <laughs> um, but <laughs> wow. Uh, I feel like for us, it's like there's sometimes a detachment, right? Because me growing up, you know, it kind of these stories kind of felt like folk tales in a way. You know what I'm saying? So to be up close and personal, um, I think what connected me or attached me to the story was that it really happened. Um, it really happened, and specifically um, with the Tuskegee's, they were, in a lot of ways, forgotten. You know, um, the allure, the fanfare of World War II, they're kind of like left out of mm -hmm. the newspaper stories, the, the newscasts. Um, so I kind of wanted to put a face, put a voice to it, um, you know, to actually have people care, if that makes sense. And, and, and Nate, how about you? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I kind of remain bowled over by what Rosie was able to accomplish and his courage and, and, you know, learning about him and getting to, you know, watch some interviews with him when I was preparing for it. Just like the way people spoke about him, it, it wasn't just this, this, he was this man of tremendous honor, but also this man of great warmth 
and grace. And I was like, All right, if I can sort of balance those two, because in, in, in one hand, you're kind of like just astounded by what, you know, his choice to go back and to remain with them. But also, you know, he, he, he led with such a, with, with just this, you know, this warm, he was just this warm handshake of a guy. I try to just sort of balance it between those, yeah. And Anthony, what about you? Your character is a very interesting character. He starts really uh, uh, in a place of kind of embarrassment and projectile vomiting. <laughs> and he ends up to be, um, you know, Small. true hero. Yeah, I think for me it was that what attracted me. Like when I read the script, I read the first couple of episodes and everyone felt like they were in Band of Brothers and Crosby felt like he was in an Adam Sandler B movie. Yeah. <laughs> everyone was being very heroic and smoking and looking cool and Crosby was going, oh God, I can't do this and throwing up on people. And I thought, I want to play that guy. <laughs> well, that's, that's the guy for me. Um, I just don't know why, I just, I just found him so, so interesting. There's a 10 minute clip of him speaking when he's in his 70s in the nose of a B-17 and he'd been through so much trauma, so much hurt, so much heartache and he still spoke with such humor and such lightness, and I thought that was a real good inspiration, you know, and I, I wanted to play him. Yeah, and and Callum, how about you? Now, your character was, uh, you know, uh, he was, he, his buddy kept him grounded, but he clearly had a temper, and, um, you know, and um, what, what about that character did you latch on to? I mean, there was a lot that I latched on to. There was a lot that I liked about John Egan, and uh, you know he has that temper, and he drinks a lot, and he dances, and he sings, and he wants to have a good time. But underneath all of that, there's a human that wants the best for the world. And um, him and Cleven joined up before Pearl Harbor, and that says a lot about him. You know, he wanted to fight the good fight in the way that he knew how or thought how. And um, I just had so much respect for him. You know, at the beginning of the war, this was an experiment. They lost a lot of men. And uh, they didn't really know what they were doing. The bloody hundredth was all over the place. At one point, uh, General LeMay was going to shut that uh, squadron down. Wow. Um, and it was just that ferocious spirit that, that I attached myself to and enjoyed. Well, you know, like what Josiah was saying about a generational disconnect, when I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, man, could I, would I have the courage to rise to the occasion how often did that occur to you guys as you, you know, as you were kind of living? As we got hand our coffees in the cockpit? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, that question would come into play, you know what I mean? Um, for me, um, you know, I think we're spoiled these days. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of it. You know, we have everything that we need. And the lads did try and create, like, the, the scenarios and <clears throat> the environment by being on the, the rig and that. Um, but that question, yeah, definitely crossed. Mm. I'd say, um, <clears throat> sorry. You go around. No, I was just going to say, for me, on a daily basis filming, I was always reminded of just how young they were. I was 23, 24 when we were shooting it, and Ken Lemons was 19. He was in charge of up to 50 men responsible for their lives. And even just kind of trying to put yourselves in those shoes on the day of filming it's it's I mean it's impossible to, to but you can try and relate and try and get yourself there but thinking my little brother who was 19 at the time thinking of putting him in a position like that and trying to kind of go back into 1942 and see what these guys were doing every day I was always reminding myself and it was it was hard to kind of even put yourselves in those shoes to get there hmm. I definitely think that um I, I myself um was constantly reminded of the ease in which we live in in the society today, the cars, you just press start, you go. You have no real like understanding or wherewithal of even what you're doing. Um, and for specifically uh, Lieutenant Macon to be that astute, you know, with numbers and mathematics with these planes, it's to me, it, it wasn't like they were just like, you know, flying to drop off cargo somewhere. You know, I mean, they're flying to kill somebody, you know? Um, and I feel like that type of levity, I think kind of all the guys carried it because we're, we're all lifting each other up, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like that was the, the biggest thing um, as far as connecting wise, where it's like, it's not about you, it's bigger than you. Um, and I think that that is kind of one of the 
you know, detachments of the, you know, I guess, the generation because it's like people are just for them today, you know, and these men couldn't be. So, also yeah. the. Go ahead, tell them. Well, the the percentages are so severe. I think seventy seven percent of men would go down, you know, and wouldn't come home. So, you know, they were putting themselves in the most volatile situations known to mankind ever, and they did it because they were fighting for something they believed in. They were fighting for each other. Well. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that that came through in Technicolor was that uh, they were made brave because of the camaraderie of their the me- the other members of the hundredth. I think, and you shot this for a long time, and while COVID was raging in the UK, so what was what was the bonding like between all you guys? I mean, who was the best prankster among you? What are some highlights here? Was there a ringleader? <laughs> Back off. <laughs> we played games. Um, yeah. Why, why am I saying that weirdly? But we did play games. We played like dice games and someone else say something. The camaraderie thing extends to a lot of places when you have something go on this long. And just by crook, no planning. We have a few people in the audience. I have to have a stand up and say hello to us really quick. And I know the boys are going to love this too. Um, the man who wrote all the music, every note in this freaking show, Blake Neely, is here somewhere. Right. Look at him. He's just a pup. Look at him. Wow. Also here, the greatest living costume designer on the planet, Colleen Atwood. Somebody make her stand up. Colleen, Colleen, where are you? Get in the light. Come on, let everybody see you. Um, great. Mark Chichevsky is the editor on every one of these episodes. And boy, we lived together, didn't we, brother? I really miss you and love you dearly. And Mike Minkler, multi Academy Award winning. Greatest mixer on the planet is here. Mike, where are you with those stupid glasses? There you are. Fantastic. And lift Jack up, too. Here's our supervising sound designer. Um, Look at them. They're hanging together still. Still sitting together at the board. Can't beat it. Mike, thank you so much for letting me point out people here who we love dearly. And David Shields, one of the cast members. David Shields there. David, stand up. All cast on. Anyone else who's in the cast? Yeah, there we go. Sawyer Spielberg, ladies and gentlemen. Woo-hoo. Anyway, I know this event was for a different purpose, but uh, you don't get to see uh, things you do for Apple and other streamers uh, in a theater like this. And to be able to see it here, rumor kind of spread out, and we had some crashers who I'm so happy they came. And thank you for that opportunity, Mike, because sure, it's your sure. guys' event. Okay. So. Okay, so Gary, this one's for you. So you, so you got these young guys and a, a whole bunch of other young guys, 325 of them to be uh, precise, and you're all the way on a road trip and you're shooting this thing for like a year at the height of COVID in the UK where they were really strict. And uh, Barry said they were playing games. Probably a lot of them were kind of drinking games, I would imagine. So what was it like to keep these, all these guys in line at a time when, and how big of a factor was COVID when you shot? This production spent $60 million on COVID. That's prevention, that's being closed down on days. If uh, anybody was in a restaurant and somebody got COVID in it, the NHS would nick everybody and you would have to stay in your house for 10 days. And people in England believe the NHS. They call you, they knock on your door. They are a fabulous organization. They're also here, stand up. Hey, you know what? Nice. That was good. We keep talking about how great these boys are. I've got to mention Lucy Bevan, who is the greatest casting person in the world who cast this show. And for the amount of speaking roles that we had and all the 
problems we had, and nobody really got cast in person. They were all cast on Zoom, if you can believe that. Um, wow. And so, anyway, she was just fabulous. Did a so, great but job. you didn't answer my question. So, <laughs> you, I'm sure you were the one who was responsible for checking up on these young men and making sure they weren't gathering in a crowd and that they were doing all those protocols. How big of a challenge was that? And who was the biggest violator? You really want to know, don't you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Barry, that's incredible. I didn't think we never said anything anywhere. <laughs> I mean, back yeah, I know. Um, yeah, well, Barry was my biggest problem early on, but it was, <laughs> it, it, it was only. For I'm a good couple, now. It was only. <laughs> yeah, now is, it is was only for what, a couple of days. Is that why he went out in episode three? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I said, hey, trouble, you get killed off. Don't watch it. That's how it goes. No, of course. <laughs> well, you know, um, now Nate. Your character and the, that scene in that last episode, you get rescued by the Russians, and you, he, he, Rosie sees exactly what the Nazis were doing to Jews and others they considered outcasts. It was so eerie to watch. Describe what shooting that was like and what the biggest challenge was for you to be faced with just such an atrocity. Yeah, I mean, you asked an, an earlier question about Sort of what what it what it means to ask yourself, you know, what 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 what, what do these men fight for, right? And how do you connect with that? And and the question really for us is like, what what would I fight for, right? Like, what would, what would it mean for me? I think we all have something. Like everyone has something like that they would they would. And you know, in preparing for this, you know, it, it involved kind of two things because it was a connection to this this story that this you know this part of Jewish history, which you know I have a personal connection to, and then. The experience of shooting it is is one of of just processing, right? So, like, what 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 brings him in there? And then, you know, I mean, it occurred to me watching it tonight that like the only thing from that whole sequence, from landing to getting back, I I I only ask questions, right? Like, he's only just like, what's you know, can I go stretch my like, what's happening? Like, there's more of these. Like, where are you going to go? What's you know, what, you know what, what's going to go next? And it's that, it's that comprehension, right? That act of comprehension to to piece it all together um, for him. That I that I really because uh, uh, you know the alternative is just like oh you know, but he doesn't know. Um, he doesn't know what he was in for. So you know, um, what I loved about this whole series is that there were many characters, but all of you had your moments to shine. It was very well um, choreographed that way. But when you're over there and, um, and you're marching in that mud and the rain, what was the toughest part, would you say, the thing that was like, oh, my God, I got to get up in the morning and do this again? What was the toughest thing? It was really cold, too. That was not fake. I'm just saying. I mean, it really was cold. <laughs> Gary spent sixty million on COVID stuff and no heaters. Oh me? Yeah. Oh, we had they had these hand warmers for us, but they really didn't they like work. Cute. They was cute. Hey, yeah. Hand warmers. <laughs> there were plenty of things to keep people warm, but we did have work to do, Mike. We couldn't just sit in our trailers. It was too fucking hot sometimes, though, up there. You know, with the with the suits. Yeah. And we had air conditioning. Yeah. Well, you know, um, in Top Gun Maverick, Tom Cruise set up this boot camp where he taught the actors to be able to withstand acting in jets because basically he was the only one in the first film who didn't go up and try to, uh, to, to say dialogue and vomit their faces off. So, And they learned how to do it. But I know it's a bit of movie magic here, but let us in on how you were able to pull this off technically. Did these guys take to the skies? The footage is absolutely breathtaking. We're watching, we're watching them get bombed from above. We're watching them drop their payload. We're watching them uh, uh, try to duck bombs that are coming from, um, you know, from the ground. Uh, tell us how, how let's, let us in a little bit. How much flying was there? Did these guys go up in the air? How did you guys do this? Mike. Time Don't worry about it. We're going into overtime. <laughs> um, you don't want to answer that, do you? No, I don't really want to answer that. Um, I, I kind of like what people think happens. You know, I mean, that's, I always hate behind the scenes kind of stuff and things that get explained that everybody loves in the world. But I like to just see it and go, wow, you know. Hmm. 
I like it. Well, let me ask it this way. Well, what, what you asked, by the way, yeah, is a but, book. But, what, was um, the, <laughs> what was the toughest thing and the most ingenious thing that somebody thought up to be able to make the flying look as real as it did and not have these guys just, um, you know, uh, airsick, even on the ground? Well, we had a system. They could get airsick. It's like a ride. You know, they're on a ride. They're in a cockpit. And stuff's flying around them, and we're trying to help them. Jet lag. Vis exactly. Visualize what's that going on in the air at the time. They get to react to things that are a little easier than the old systems of in a CGI green screen, you know, flash a red light. Hey, no, there's the bomb. You know, and you could actually give them stuff that was a little better. In the end, it's not a perfect art, you know, and what happens is uh, you do fall back on the greatest CGI I feel I've ever seen in my life, which was done for us by Steven Rosenbaum, who's in this audience. <laughs> Steven? They'll CGI him in later. Where is he? Steven, oh my God, he's here. But he, anyway, seriously, I mean, I'm just, I've done a lot of this in my career and I just think he's amazing mm. what he does. Um, really great. But unfortunately, now we have this image of if there was, we were having a group shot while you were on the set, we'd have these guys all covered in ping pong balls, wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Green <laughs> screen. <laughs> no, this was, uh, I'm kidding. I mean, this was absolutely brilliant. So now, Gary, you, how long did you put into this? Is it three years? Is that fair? Yeah, three years, sure. Three years, sure. Wow. And we shot for 10 months, guys, right? And that, and yeah. so you're, so a movie like Greyhound, which you also made, and which, which was a big hit on Apple TV Plus, how long did that take to make? Well, that's more in the uh, three month range of shooting, right? You still wow. spend six months posting it. The interesting thing about Greyhound is that there is not one drop of real water in a movie that's entirely on the North Atlantic. So, that's, it just shows you these, uh, Steven Rosenbaum, what do you do without that guy? <laughs> what do you do without him? Well, now, um, so I'm sure there are other stories to tell in World War II. Um, what, a, what a gigantic time commitment. What do you think? Um, you and Tom and Steven go back to the well one more time and tell a different aspect? Because we certainly don't get tired of uh, watching them. No, but you know, I, I, I really feel like we did this trio of movies and we never thought we were gonna do another one after the one we did, but I'm pretty sure we're, we're about done. And, and these things kill you more in their length than anything else. They take a long time. These guys are tied up forever. You know, you're, you're really just uh, working on all cylinders for a very long period of time. You, get a great sequence that you're just loving it. It's just killing you, blah, blah, and then you've got eight hours and 49 minutes more of a movie. You know, it's just, it never seems to end. You're chipping away at the biggest rock you could ever imagine. Am I whining? No, you're not. You're, so you're... I think we're more, you'll see hour and a half movies coming out of all of us, I think. And, and how, 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 you wonder how, if you'll see that many ambitious things that are that ambitious, what sort of a budget was this? Can you tell us? Well, I think everybody knows this was between 250 and 300 million. Wow. And wow. you know, I went, yeah, man, we're, we're gonna kick its ass. You, know, you wanna leave, sir? <laughs> okay, I just wanted to view. <laughs> I'd say you're packing up your luggage. Um, but, but, um, but now that's not a lot of money. I mean, most of these movies you're enjoying nowadays are like over 200, 250, and they're lying. Mm -hmm. you right. Know, so, uh, but we're not. <laughs> but that's how much it was. I think it's time we told. What an incredible, what an incredible uh, commitment. Well, you know what? Um, this is extraordinary. If uh, unless you guys have some experience that you would like to share, I, I think we've done what we need to do here. Hey, nah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, much. for coming.